Hello, hello. Oh, wait, one sec. Yes, I'm in. One sec. Uh, hold. Wait. Um. One second, everybody. I'm sorry. Hold on. One sec. Uh, Okay. 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 Um. Hello, hello. Hello, folks. Uh, greetings, greetings. Good afternoon, hi. Okay. Good afternoon, Marilyn. Okay. Um, I'm not even putting up my board right now. I mean, I have a board ready, but from my experience in the other class this morning, we might not even use it. So I'm not so good afternoon, Matthew. Okay. Um, and it looks like a small class. Okay. Uh, um welcome to the very last good afternoon, Amanda. Okay. And okay, good afternoon. Um what, ah, there's oh, and here comes okay. Hello, Amanda, and here comes uh, okay. Oh, and there's Cheska. Okay, now it feel okay. Now it's beginning to feel like this class. Okay, wait, who has bet? I wait, who has bet? Oh, you? Oh, okay, okay, all right. Well, I would never have said uh, thought that, much less said it. But okay. Oh, I didn't. It looks like great to me. All right. All right. Anyway. Um, okay. Um, so, welcome to the last class. I, um, um, I'm going to be very sad to leave you people and have you leave me. Um, I, I am very pleased that most of you will be taking physics 204, whether it's <coughs> whoever with, and I hope you're not a stranger next semester and all that stuff. Um, so I, so here's the, the reality. I did actually have a whole very specific plan for today's class. Hi, hi, Chris. Okay. I had a whole very specific plan and hello. Hi you. Okay. I guess I said, hello. Okay. So I had a very specific plan for today. Hello, Giselle. Okay. All right. Um, and hello, Melita. Okay. Now we're out. Hello. All right. So now again, now it feels a little bit more like this class. Now I had a very specific plan for today's class, but an experience that I had in the earlier section threw things into a different direction. So and I'll, so so I'm gonna so I'm readjusting here. Um, I want to make our last minutes worthwhile for sure. Um, I want to close down the semester in the most proper way possible. My main goal, I mean, I want you to have learned as much physics as possible, and I would like you to keep learning physics in 204. I would like physics to make sense to you, and I would like you to like physics. But today, my my goal is actually to put you in a position where we can walk away from one another with a maximum of education and a maximum of high outcomes, i.e. high grades, um, but also a minimum of stress or confusion. So really this last day is for me to try to, if I can, reduce stress as much as I can without threatening each person's outcome. Why am I saying all that? <coughs> <coughs> Um, because really what I want to deal with today is nuts. That's why. Um, the nuts and bolts, the logistics of the end game. Um, well, uh, we might, get, I actually don't want to get distracted today. I mean, it, I, I, yeah, I mean, we might, but we're not going to get distracted by it. We're not, uh, we're not going to get distracted that way. Um, okay. So here's, here's where I'm going with this. Um, it turns out in the other class, in their lab last Friday, they didn't really get a chance to deal with their practice exam for the final exam. And I don't want the two classes to be in a vastly different place or position when they go into the final exam because it will because so well, I mean, over the three classes, but particularly my two sections. So, so let me just start 
by asking you this. In your lab last Wednesday, can you briefly, could someone briefly either vocally or, it, oh, a lot of people, okay, yeah, Melita, yeah, what, yeah, tell me, Melita, yeah. Well, we went over it, but, like, the rule was that we were only allowed to be corrected, not taught, like, the right thing. So, like, like Professor Mercedes wasn't allowed to, like, give us the answer. She could only correct what we did wrong. So it made it, like, hard because, like, we didn't know how to do some of the things because we hadn't learned them. Like, the very end one. So we were, like, confused. Like, the formula, because she said we could only use the formulas that we've de uh, derived in class. But we didn't derive them yet in class, so then we were, like, a little stuck. Okay. That's very helpful. That's very constructive. Okay. So first of all, let me, I'll cut to the end. So yes, the stuff at the end of the practice exam, to be like totally honest, that stuff, which is just the end and is a small, that was the last chunk that I was intending to give you what you needed for that today in class. And I was intending to do that in the other section this morning. Because of something that happened with them, I was not able to do that in the other section. Mm. Okay, I think I know what I'm going to do. Okay, so, 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 all right. So, so the stuff at the end might end up being our major focus for whatever time we have together today. I might go straight to the stuff, or I might make a big emphasis on the stuff at the end. Let me preface it by saying, I'm aware that the stuff right at the end, it was meant for the end for a reason, and it was meant for the end. So, of course, yes, absolutely, you have not heard what you needed to hear about the stuff at the end yet. That's my main goal for today. So that that's now as to the rest of it, or that was my main goal for today, and I think it still is. As to the rest of it, that's very interesting. That That's actually interesting that Mercedes did it that way. So, okay, but what you're saying is for the rest of the exam, you guys tried it or you had things you tried you shared them and she would sort of say when you were like off on the wrong path or something with stuff, but she wouldn't necessarily tell you what the right path was. Yeah. She said like we, she wasn't allowed to give us the answers because like the final exam is similar to it. But like if we were wrong, she could tell us we're wrong, but she can't like get on the board and start writing out how to do it like correctly. So we spent a lot of time like, together figuring it out which is good for our problems about the thing like abilities but that means that like we didn't get to review the whole thing so like we don't okay. know if we know how to do that all right all right no that's very helpful I, I think i can address that all right I'm, i think she did the right thing i'm glad she did that but yes okay i understand that maybe i can do more maybe we'll okay i i get it that's okay i think that actually gives me a no it was definitely like it definitely showed us that like we knew more than we thought. So it's definitely like the right in terms of that. And we were able to work together to get the things. It's just that we didn't get through all of it because the lab period's limited. Oh yes, yes, yes. And and last thing, so and first you worked on it individually before she even taught. Is that correct? Like, yeah, okay. Okay. This is very yeah. helpful. Okay. Okay. This is all very helpful. I think I know what to do with this. Okay. And again, I'm being I'm doing this on purpose because I had a whole plan for this last class, but I, I definitely, it would not have worked, it turns out for you. So forgive me, all of you, if I'm being a little bit, I'm trying to do the best possible thing we can do for the next hour or whatever to actually end this right. And and I think I'm getting, I think I know what it is, but okay, that's very helpful. Um, Is there anybody else who wants to add or so? I mean, is there anybody else who wants to add or so? Oh, the, I'm see, oh my God, wait a minute. Are you guys doing what I think you're doing? Wait, did you arrange this? Hold on a second. Oh, oh, whoa, what are we doing? Yeah. Well, ask, you better ask Michelle Quatch what you're doing and you better ask her in a side discord server or something. Cause, oh, 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 oh my God. Whoa, you did it. Wait, I don't even know. Okay, we're recording right now. All right, let the record show. I get it. Even if you don't have it, obviously you get Michelle Quatch brings it in. Okay, so yeah, that this counts. Whole I, I am first time since COVID. Definitely first time. And granted, it's interesting how you managed to, I guess everybody who wasn't willing to do this, you just like kicked out of the class or executed or had them like in some field somewhere because like, obviously this is not the whole class, but this is, I get it. 
Yes, for the, and it looks like from all your faces that you all get, oh my God, yeah, let's go. All right, there are, wait, Michelle, she's like, Michelle, what the? <laughs> okay, now you're right, I am distracted. You totally go, all right. And I, I don't want to waste your time today. I will say you are, I remind, you can remind me by text. One of you remind me by text. Somehow I, oh my God, picture. Okay, that's great. Send me that or something. You will get points for this. So, yeah, in fact, wait, yeah, that picture. Yeah, you will. Um. Is there a way for me to know every name? Yeah, I, I guess that picture has every name. Yeah, that picture. Okay, you will. Also, you're going to be recognized in some other way too. Because no, this is definitely record breaking. And I'm, I'm going to tell other faculty. No, anyway. All right, I will. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed and very happy. And I want to make your time worthwhile. So I will. And yes, you don't have, now you've done it. You don't have to like suffer the entire time. Although it really has helped. It's too, okay. Anyway, that is amazing. I mean, I assume everybody understands what I'm raving about. Yeah, you all get what I'm raving. Yeah, I mean, well done. Yes, okay. No, that is 100%. That's the- It was other. a present of the thank you for the last day's class. We coordinated. Wow, I'll take, thank you. Well, like happy Hanukkah to me. I mean, I guess everyone likes exams or something. Right, no, I will try to- uh, all right, so I'm still going to try to deliver you a class that actually helps you for your exam and all that. But no, this is very touching. I don't think there's ever been a faculty meeting that has 100%. I don't think I've ever been in any, even a family. Re like you win. You definitely win. I do want, I, if I could find a way to post this on my, I mean, this should go, I think this is record breaking. Okay. That's amazing. Um, And oh, that's what you look like. How nice. Thank you. Okay. um, So let me make this worth your while. Uh, so I'm going to get to, so forgive me now, I'm going to get back to nitty gritty just because it is the last day. My goal here, the goal is for you to do as well as possible in the class legitimately for all of you, right? I said that at the if it, now this is the time of year, I do suggest if any of you hasn't, some of you have obviously been like paying more attention to the class as we go than others, life happens, all that, but <clears throat> You, this is the time that you should be aware of how the grading system works. If you still don't get it or you're so confused about it, you should watch videos from the first two days of class or like last week or something. You should all, like, for example, you need to all be aware that yes, whichever test you ended up having done better on, I'm going to count more than the other one. And yes, you should be aware. Oh, and I will take some back late assignments up until midnight tonight because it's the last day of classes so you can still do i don't know if it's worth it to you but if you want to you can still do that yes you should be aware that there's still a lot more points coming to you that haven't been recorded yet you're getting more points than than you think on back things um you should be aware of all that yes you should be aware that um that I don't have a lit that not everybody will get an A, but there's no limit on how many A's or A minuses or B pluses there are. There's no limit. That doesn't mean everybody gets one, but it means that whatever I've said at the beginning of the, you know, at the year, but that you're not competing against each other or against me for an A. That's all still true. Um, you should be aware that the final exam that will be posted no later than 8 p.m. tomorrow, and that will be very similar to the practice exam that you work with Mercedes, it'll be very, 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 very similar to that with perhaps some tweaks at the end. We'll address that in a minute. It'll be very similar to that. It'll be posted no later than 8 p.m. tomorrow. It said in Google Classroom that it was due back midnight of this coming Saturday. That's what it says in Google Classroom. But I changed that this morning uh, because there's an inconsistency. It said Saturday, but then it gave a date that didn't make, that was actually Sunday. So I, I changed it to midnight Sunday. Okay, so your your final exam is due back no later than midnight of this coming Sunday. And that is strict. Like that, you, you, I mean, if there's an issue, you got to reach out to me in advance and good luck to us both because everything moves really fast to the registrar at this time of year. Um. You will when you so so things about how grades work and stuff like that. Like once you take your exam or once you get your exam, you know, then I'm gonna be then the ball goes in my court and I'm gonna be busy with all the classes trying to get all the grades in the time and all that. It's like not a fun time for anybody. Um, so I'll ask that you have some patience and and space while I'm working on the grades for everybody. Here's the deal: you will when you get your final grade for the whole class. You will get a Google sheet or an Excel sheet 
that will break down all the details of your grade. It will all be clear and transparent at the end, like exactly how your grade was calculated. In many, many cases, hopefully most, you're going to find that your grade might be, might be, in many cases, you'll find that it's better than you think in many cases. Obviously, sometimes that's not true, depending on who you are. But whatever it is, you're going to find at the end, you'll get a sheet that shows you the full breakdown of where the grade came from. You'll see that the math applies in the exact same way to everybody. There is one mathematical system that is being applied to every student the same way. And it's and it'll seem transparent when you get that sheet. I mean, you'll understand it when you get the sheet. Um, the math is the same for every student, but the math is designed, the system is designed to allow different types of students and different types of work to get you to a high grade. Like some students will get a very, some of you will get a very high grade, like a grade that you want or a B plus or an A minus or an A, you'll get that because even though you never did a stitch of homework or never like showed up to class once, you rocked the exams. Like some students will get an A because they just rock the exams, that happens. Other students will do very poorly on the exams, but have done so much homework and, and have shown up to class so much and have participated so much and or done so much in lab that they managed to get an A as well. I'm just reminding you in advance that the idea is that eat the math and the rules are the same for all students, but the math is designed to allow different types of students and different types of work to get you to a final grade. I'm just reminding you of that because in the end, when you get a grade, it won't be arbitrary. It won't be, it will be neither an arbitrary punishment, nor will it be an arbitrary gift. It will be based on the data that you'll see in a Google, I mean, in a spreadsheet, okay? And I'm saying that to say, because I know that there's been like up until this moment, people are a little fuzzy on where they are with their grades. I understand that. And I don't like that, but it's true. So I'm also here to say a couple of things. I don't think I said this last time, a couple of things. One, Certainly, once you get your grade from CUNY first, and even if you have to like wait an hour or whatever for the grading sheet, once you get your grade from CUNY first on like the 27th um, of December, then before you do anything, like check the, the grading sheet of how it, especially if you're in some ways concerned, check how it was calculated, look how it was calculated and see if there's actually any mistake, like something missing or something like that. Uh, it, once you've let your grade sink in and once you've looked at how it was calculated, if you still think there's actually a problem like you, that's not the score you got on your exam or something is missing, then of course, politely and gently reach out to me and know, know if you think there's a mistake in your grade and you think the grade should actually be higher, if you politely and gently, maybe wait a day or a, like an hour, but if you politely and gently reach out to me in the form of a question, like I'm confused, I feel like I did this, but it doesn't look like it's in your Excel sheet. Like, is it possible there's an error? Could you look into it? I will and know in advance, I'm just as interested in you. If there's a mistake, I'm just as interested as you are in correcting it. And I will, I there is a form that I could submit to change a grade if I need be, and it's not drama and it doesn't need to be drama. So please, first of all, know what you do when you get your grade is you check the Google sheet, make sure if you really think after like you've meditated for a bit and you've seen the, then reach out and we'll work with it. Or I'll tell you, well, actually, I don't think blah, 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 but let's keep everything friendly because I want you to get a good grade just as much as you do. That's number one. Number two, this is almost more important or more surprising perhaps. And stop me if I've said this before, but if, because everything gets pressed at this time of year for all of us, if by the time I get to the night that I have to submit all the grades, um, and they all have to be submitted at once, and it is it is a real deadline, um, if I, if any one of you, if I look and suddenly I realize this person's going to get a D or an F, and I didn't see it coming, and they didn't see it coming, like if I suddenly think you're going to get a D or an F, and there was no we didn't have time to prepare for this. I'm telling you right now what you'll see on your what you'll see on your trend on CUNY first is an incomplete. You'll see an I, which is not really what that great that's intended for. I'm not really supposed to do this, but I do. 
Um, if you see an eye, well, first of all, you should know what, if you've never gotten one before, incomplete literally just means that. It means incomplete. It's meant really for people that are in the hospital when the final exam takes place or something like that. Like it means we don't have all the data in yet for a grade. We're holding the grade until the professor and the student work out something like take a final exam that hasn't been taken yet or something like that. And ever, if you've ever gotten an incomplete, it just holds the spot in the grid. And then as long as within like a month or two, the or before the next semester gets underway significantly, the professor and the student, as long as they work out their arrangement, the professor will then submit a form with the actual real grade, which could be anything, could be a C or could be an A. Um, and they'll submit that and the incomplete turns into a real grade and the incomplete completely goes away and it's never ever lasts on your transcript or anything. You just get the grade and the grade lasts and the incomplete is was just a placeholder that's as though it never happened. If you get an incomplete from me, if you're listening to me right now, if you're here right now, if you see an incomplete, what you all what you need to do is just reach out to me in a friendly, open way and just say, I saw the incomplete. Can we talk? What are next steps that we can deal with, Professor? And and I'll reach out to you and I'll set and I'll write back and I'll say, yeah, let's have a Zoom meeting or a phone call or whatever. And I'll say, yeah, the truth is that both of your exams were so disastrous that you would have failed the course, but I didn't think you had ample warning to deal with that fact and need, and it caught me by surprise too. So here's the arrangement we're going to make. I'm going to need you to like redo one of the exams or something, something, something like that. Like all of this is not what really, I'm not really supposed to be saying this kind of stuff on recordings, but, but I want you to know that that's, how, I don't think it's fair or cool to just suddenly be shocked by a D or an F on CUNY first. So this is what I do. Okay. So if you get it, so if you get it incomplete, don't freak out. Like seriously, don't have a, don't check yourself into a hospital and also don't come after my family with like a torch. Like just read, just take it as an invitation to reach out to me and to realize that we have to do something to fix your status in this course, because if we don't, you would have failed and I don't want to take you by now. Okay. Now, if you don't, if you get incomplete and you don't notice it for weeks, if like you're that removed from the whole deal and you never reach out to me, then it does just automatically turn into a WU. Okay, so the, the two parts of this whole little quick speech, the speech that I'm giving right now is, when you end up with your grade in this class, assuming that you are satisfied with it, when you end up after the dust is settled, you should know that every semester there are people that don't end up with a great grade or a passing grade. Or there always are because there are always people that for whatever situation in their lives, like can't make this a priority enough to do it. Like, And it's, it's just what it is. So if you do end up with a grade that you feel satisfied by, don't consider it an automatic gift. Consider it something you actually did earn because not everybody does. On the other hand, if you end up with an incomplete, realize there's unfinished business between you and me and we got to finish that business somehow so that you can be okay. And we will, as long as you approach me like gently and like, you know, like, like from the same team as me. Um, does that make sense? So I want quick, do you, oh wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Do, do you understand what I'm saying so far? Honestly, that's a, okay, I'll take Jessica's. Okay, and that's real. Like every semester, there's a couple of people that do get a D or an F. There are a couple of people that do get an I or whatever. It is, if you just get an I, it means there's still hope. Don't worry. And some people's I's have turned into A's in the past. They usually don't turn into A's, but like, it just means, wait, there's something incomplete. We got it. Okay, that's other. Now the other thing is really quick. If for whatever reason you end up having to take this course again, and I don't think I'm talking to anybody who's in the room right now, but you could spread the word to your friends. Like there are people that do end up having to take the course again for whatever reason. It might just not be the right time in their lives to do this. If you end up having to take this course again for whatever reason, please know there is no shame and there's no hostility about that. If I get to see you again in this course for whatever reason, whether it's I will greet you with open arms a second time and I'll take it as an increased challenge to me that I got to do a better job working with you the next time to make sure you never have to see me a fourth time or third, whatever time. Okay. If you have to come back to, that you've already been punished by having to pay the money twice, that's a big punishment enough. And that actually should be the only drama in your mind past that. We just do it again. And I, and remember that I never could have learned any of this physics if I didn't get a chance to do it over and over and over again every single year. So there's no shame if you have to do this a second time. That's the other thing. Um, 
I'm almost done with all these little speeches, but I just want to, okay. Um, I think that's, oh, last other thing, it, I might have mentioned this too. If in the next couple of days, while you're dealing with all your finals and stuff, if you get a survey that comes to you from like Blackboard or looks weird or looks even fake or something, but if you get a survey from Blackboard or technically from me through Blackboard, of course you would be liable to throw it away because I never use Blackboard, but it is real and it is important and you will get extra credit if you do it. You will get more points if you do it for real. Like I will never see, and it's not about me. It's not a teacher evaluation thing. It's like, it's not that. It's just about, it's about something else, but something that I'm, that I care about, which is your ability to learn physics. So, so if you get something from Blackboard that's a survey, know that I will never see your responses to the survey, but I will see whether you did it or not. And you will get points if you did it. So please, so don't throw it away. That, and it might come from my name. It might come from Dr. Delgado Cruz's name. But if it's from Blackboard and it's about physics, do it, please. That's another thing. Um, and you will get points. Uh, um, other, I think, is that it? I think those are my logistical things. Again, it's really been, I mean, I'm sounding intense now because the end of the year or semester freaks me out as much almost as it freaks some of you out. I like to close down as happily as possible, but as fairly as possible. Um, I am hoping to see you guys one way or another next semester. I will be around tomorrow, but I'm telling everybody that. So I have a feeling it's going to be a little bit crazy tomorrow, but I will be around if you come even earlier. That Usually I don't get there till after physics 204, which usually ends at 11, but there is no classes tomorrow. So I'll be there earlier. If you can get there earlier, if you want to work out anything, all the better. I Like I should be there like from nine, maybe even earlier on. So that's that. Um, and again, please reach out for recommendations and support in your future or jobs and all that stuff. Okay. Those are my logistical things. What I plan to do, wait, what time is it? 3.30, okay. I, I do think I know how best to use your time for the sake of this final exam. I think I know the answer, but before I do that, wait, let me see. I'm just looking. Well, I do want, I do want you back in my class. Wait, he made a speech just back. Well, oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm looking at the chat, wait. Why am I manifest? Okay, Cheska, that is kind of hilarious. Well, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, wait, wait. Right. No, I am. It's actually. Okay. I'm looking at the chat. I mean, that's funny, Amanda. Okay. Uh, how makes you, oh my God, Michelle F. Wow. Okay. 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 Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Okay. I'm, okay. Okay. No, I'll address the one thing because I do, I mean, it is, you're all very funny and I will miss you. And no, I don't, I'm not going to fail you just so I can see you again, although it's tempting, but I'll just address the thing that Cheska, I mean, I know Cheska's sort of joking, but sort of not. It's actually, believe me, that is on my mind. I'm very, I'm very sensitive to like manifesting and all that. And I'll be totally honest with you before I move on. Mostly what I'm here to manifest is that you should hopefully feel confidence and serenity going into your physics final and you and you hopefully mostly we should end on the note of everybody feeling like they did learn something and they will do okay on their grades that's largely what i want to manifest but i but the reason i'm dwelling on the other things too is well hardly that I still do want you to prepare this final exam. Like I, I've, I'm walking a fine line. I don't want this entire last speech to just be like, it's all okay no matter what, guys. No, no, really, it's all okay no matter what. So now go just, just drink beer for the next seven days and like, don't worry, the A will take care of itself. I don't want to send that message because that's backfired in the past for obvious reasons. Like that's not my message. Number two. And no, I don't think if you're in the room right now, are you probably going to get a D or an F? No. Should I keep using this? Should I keep mentioning those letters just to manifest them more? No, I shouldn't. But I do want to reinforce the idea that not only should you actually do, like take this final exam seriously and close down with dignity and be ready for 204, but I also do want to remind you, like at the end, because I think a lot of you who are sitting in the room right now for this class, in particular, I think I'm hoping that a lot of you will actually do well. And I want to tell you in advance that if you do well in this class, it's not a joke. 
And it's not a gift and it's not automatic. I'm partly talking about that other stuff to reinforce because I know you people, you guys are the people, especially in physics. There's a tendency, like first you get something in physics, you're like, that's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. That's crazy. I hate everybody. Whoever came up with this question is outrageous and the professor's even worse and I hate myself and I'm an idiot. And then you look at the question long enough and it starts to make sense and you start to get it right, whoever you are. The physics students have a tendency once they understand a physics thing, then they're like, oh, well, that's obvious. I mean, why is that even, that's like not even interesting. I'm not, I'm so stupid that I didn't get it before. And I'm not even smart for getting it now. Like this is just idiot. Like there's a thing about physics students who never give themselves credit at any step of the process, along the process, because either everything's too absurd to matter or everything's too obvious for them to think that they were smart to have gotten it right. But that's not true. If you end up doing well in this class, you did do something. It wasn't a joke and it's not a gift. And the evidence for the, that is the fact that some people every single semester won't do well in the class. Hopefully they're not in the room right now, but I'm just manifesting that crap or I'm mentioning that crap to manifest to you that you still should work in the final. And then when you rock this class, quark willing, you will have actually accomplished something that was not automatic because it isn't that. Okay. And also, right. Because people freak out in the last week. And frankly, when I submit my grades, I don't want like an onslaught of like I don't want to be put in the asylum the minute I submit my grades. So I like to put in place the processes for everybody to remain calm, even under very unusual scenarios that will probably apply to none of you in this room. That's my response to just, okay, wait, did I say, wait, I didn't say, okay. I don't think I've ever, okay, 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 okay. Well, it was a good to know, it was a fair, okay, Jeff, it was fair, okay, okay. No, it wouldn't be, well, okay. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Enough. I get, I think I get that you get me. Okay. Um, okay. I think we all understand each other. So wh what are we going to do with this remaining time? Good question. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that what I'm going to show you right now, very quickly on the board, I'm going to show you the equations that are relevant to the, well, but we're going to end with me showing you the equations that are relevant to the two last parts of that exam. That's what I'm gonna show you right now. I'm gonna show you exactly to the extent that you need them for the last two parts of the exam. I promise you that the last two parts of the exam or those last bits are not, they're not meant to be mind crunchers as long as you actually know the equations. So I'll show you the equations right now. That's number one. So I'm gonna go backwards in effect. I'm gonna start right away with the material right at the end of the, um, of the exam, okay? And I'll turn on my board in a second to do it. But then I'm also gonna say, the other class didn't get that this morning. I'm gonna ask you to spread the word. I'm gonna tell them to obviously, but I will post this video where I do those last equations for the other class. What did the other class get? What's on their video that you should definitely watch when this is all over? In the other section, I walked through, I literally walked through the exam from beginning to almost the last bit that you're missing, okay? Did I, did I write anything down? No, I talked it, the whole thing. But did I give a bunch of answers? Oh yes, I, to put it mildly. I basically presented what I was looking for in the entire exam. So I think the best, but I didn't give the last equations in. So I think the best deal for everybody I mean, and again, for anybody who's willing, it, this is a perfect thing back to like the sort of not joke joke from Cheska is like, if you watch the other video, some of you will think like, oh my God, he's just like liver, literally delivered the end of this course to us. Like what is even, like what's even the issue here? The issue is that I promise you, even for having done that, there will still be people that don't ever watch the video or never knew that I made that video or who just don't, like, there will still be people that won't do the exam. If you actually watch the video and and ha and use it as a review of material that you've been trying to do for the whole semester, you sh and you listen to the pro tips, you should rock it. If you you should, but just enough people won't that when you rock it, it will have been an accomplishment. So for the rest of the exam, and you'll have to pay attention. I didn't write anything down, but I talked. So. For most of the exam, the stuff that you don't feel that you've gotten directly from Mercedes last um, Wednesday, you can get it from the other video, which is actually already on YouTube as we, I think, as we speak. But for you right now, I'm going to do the equations at the end and they'll watch it. Does that make sense? Are we good? Like, do, do we? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's do that. Um, 
Okay, so three, four. So bear with me for a second while I. And please tell them if you have friends in the other class. Again, this is not a competition. It isn't. That's what two hundred four is for. No, just kidding. Okay. Oh. Okay. The two equations. We are bad. Okay, you are hilarious in the chat. I do see it. Okay, all right, and I'm going to try to do this quickly. I don't. Well, I'll try. Um, Okay. Okay, the first thing is, okay, the first thing is, assume some particle. So the first thing, the first thing, uh, I'm, we're talking about curved motion here. My goal is to give you two equations that you need, and here's, here's the development. And they're both on the front page of these notes, but I'm now going to try to explain them both in order. All right, the first thing is, if you have a particle, if you have an object, with some velocity, like say an object moving to the right. Then if you come along and exert a force on that object, right? If you come along and exert a force on that object that's along the axis of motion. In other words, a force that's parallel to the axis of velocity could be strictly parallel, like zero degree angle, or could be technically anti-parallel, like 180 degree angle, but any component of any force that's exerted along the direction of motion, we already know does work on the object, right? And therefore transfers kinetic energy to the object, to the mass, and therefore changes the speed of the mass, right? That we already know, that's like, that's like the last few weeks of work. But the question that has been lingering, that keeps coming up with things like the normal force or tension or something, the, the question is, what about if you if something's moving like this and you knock it from the side? You don't push it from back or from front. You knock it, like, like in this picture, what if you knock it perpendicularly or you pull it perpendicularly to its motion? What happens then? Well, what we said yesterday or uh, Monday, the component... That's a question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry. On the slide before, um, what was the, in the parentheses next to the force, like arrow? Oh, oh, sorry. Right. Or I'm just saying, like, that's a backwards arrow. Like, I'm saying, like, if the force is from... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you.
Okay. Um, like I said two days ago, if you not if you exert a force perpendicular to the displacement or the displacement in time, therefore the velocity of an object. Well, you must be contributing to the object's acceleration. F net equals ma. When we exert forces, we contribute to acceleration. And acceleration means change in velocity. But if you're not changing the object's speed, what are you doing? Well, you're changing the object's direction because velocity means speed and direction. So, so far, the summary of what I'm saying is when you knock something, the component, of, when you knock, when you push or pull something, that's already in motion, the component of your push or pull that's parallel to the motion transfers energy and contributes to a change in speed. The component of your force of your push or pull that is perpendicular to motion uh, does not do work, does not transfer energy, cannot affect the speed, but it must be affecting the velocity in general. So what it affects is the direction. In, in, other, in other words, really, Physically, like if I push this velocity vector, like from the side, what I do is I push the velocity vector. If you like, like if I push it from below, I push it up, I'm going to angle the velocity vector. So it's going in a different direction. I won't change the length of the velocity vector. So I don't change the magnitude, i.e. the speed, but I'm going to knock the velocity vector into a different orientation. That's what perpendicular force components do. Now I'm going to take that a little bit further. I'm going to say, So, oh, so when I change the direction of something, what do I do? I turn it, I, right? To, to change the direction of motion is to move it from the straight line path into some other path, i.e. make a turn, right? Um, so let's look at turns. Let's look at, no, and I'll say that even, and when you turn something, you have to turn it smoothly. Like nature is not a cartoon, right? You, um, Everything happens progressively and continuously. You don't jump, you can't jump from zero degrees to 15 degrees without passing through one degree, two degree, three degree, et cetera. And you can't even jump from zero degrees to one degree without passing through half a degree, et cetera, et cetera. So everything happens smoothly. So if I ever push something or pull something perpendicular to its motion, I must be starting to curve its path. Whenever Whenever something is traveling in a curved path, that small can be regarded as the arc of a circle. Like whenever you're curving, you right, like the only difference, in other words, a really, really long, what am I trying to say? Whenever you're curving, you're traveling in an arc. The arc can be thought of as being cut out of some larger circle. If you look at this picture right above, something is like turning progressively to the right. So, right, it's not turning instantaneously. Nothing, it's not making a jagged corner because it's nature, it's space and time. But something, if you catch something in the act of turning to the right, 
if you think about it, each one of these velocity vectors, right? Each one of these velocity vectors is being shifted. It's being redirected more and more like toward the right. And what, and what does that mean toward the right? It means toward, toward the center of the circle from which this arc is cut, right? Each one of these arrows is being shoved down, like, like the arrow all the way to the bottom. It got shoved slightly to the right to make that next arrow. And the arrow all the way at the top, which is fully facing to the right, if this keeps going, it's gonna be pulled down a little bit, right? Like, like I'm saying to turn is to be pulled or pushed toward the center of a circle in which, from which your curve has been cut out, right? And I'm saying that each one of these velocity vectors is accelerating toward the center of this circle. Acceleration means change in velocity. Uh, so I'm saying if you're if you're traveling along that arc, right? I'm not saying that you're traveling toward the center. No, you're traveling along the arc. Your velocities are along the arc of that circle. But each at every single instant, your velocity vector is being pulled or pushed. It's being changed in the direction toward the center of the circle. Um, I'm saying ultimately curved motion involves a conflict between the velocity vector and the acceleration vector at any given moment, the instantaneous velocity vector and the instantaneous acceleration vector. I'm saying, just looking at the time, I'm saying Think of your headlights, say you're in a car or driving a car, think of your headlights as velocity vectors and your wheels as acceleration vectors or a vector. Think about this for a second. If you're driving your car or you're in a car and someone's driving, right? When you're heading straight, when you're traveling in a straight line, your wheels are going in the same and pointing in the same direction as you're going to go. Like your headlights are facing out in front of you where you're heading toward and they're lined up with your wheels. Where you're going at this moment and where you're going to go is all one and the same. Your velocity vector and your acceleration vector are pointing along the same axis when you're going straight. When you start to turn, you turn the wheel. Now think about it. The wheels of your car start turning. Say you turn to the right. The wheels of your car start turning to the right, but they're in they're in conflict with your headlights, which are still facing forward, right? So at this moment, like you pour, you turn your wheels to your right. At that moment, the whole car carriage is still facing forward. The headlights are like what the car is actually doing at that moment. It's its velocity. But the wheels are pulling the car in a different direction. The wheels are like where the car is going to go. They are not along the same axis as the headlight. And where and if you're trying to turn right, the wheels are heading right. They're pulling you toward the center of a circle, which is all toward your right, like the centers to your right, right? And if you keep your hands on the, if you keep the wheels all the way, like to the right, and you just and you just keep it there and you never line it back up with the headlights, you keep turning to the right, you keep turning to the right, you keep, you eventually make a full circle, right? Like that's how you do donuts in a parking lot, which don't do, um, right? Like you perpetually have your acceleration vector not along the same axis as your velocity vector. That's what cur curved motion is that conflict between velocity and acceleration. The acceleration is perpetually changing the velocity vector, the velocity direction. And if you keep doing that constantly, you make a constant curve, which is known as a circle, right? So this is, so, okay, so we're almost, we're almost, so I'm saying if you're turning at all, you are necessarily accelerating toward the center of the circular arc along which you're turning. Like that's my statement. 
that if you are turning at all, you are necessarily accelerating. And what are you in, in what direction? Toward the center of the arc along which you're traveling. Now, but now think about that for a minute. Like again, what I'm saying over and over again is your acceleration in this context means change in direction. Like you can do donuts in a parking lot at a constant speed. You can keep turning and turning and right, like, right. I mean, you, you can put cruise control on your car and put your wheel all the way to the right. And you'll just go round and round and round, always in a different direction, but always at the same speed. It's not a contradiction, right? So I'm saying, I'm saying as long as you're in a circle or in any curved arc at all, you have acceleration. You have acceleration, even if, even if, your acceleration doesn't represent change in speed. You at least have change in direction if you're traveling in a circle. Now, you could be doing both. You could be speeding up or slowing down and traveling in a curve. But but if you're in a curve, you definitely... So if we're in a curve, if curve... Like you're traveling in this curve, then... So here you're at this curve, right? Your velocity vector would always be along the tangent line of the curve that you're in. Like your velocity vector points in the direction that you're actually going at that moment. You will definitely have an acceleration vector pointing in toward the center of the circle. Like, like even if you're not speeding up or slowing down, the key point is if you're curving at all, you definitely have an accelerate, you have a component of acceleration that's pointing into the center and where did it come from? From some net force that was pushing you perpendicularly to the direction you're going in, right? If you're curving, that must be the case. That acceleration toward the center of the circle is, is written as a cent. It stands for centripetal acceleration. It means acceleration toward the center. It must be there if you're curving at all. And it must come from a net force along that direction. Okay, but this again, what I'm, and we're almost done with this now. I'm about to give you the equation, but this, the subtlety of this is, again, this is not change in speed. This is change in direction. But if you're changing direction, you must have this component of acceleration. Um, um, What did you have um, under the T before on the left side? Under the T. Wait, where? Sorry. sorry, the V. The V. Like, what's that line supposed to represent under the V? Oh, oh no, it, I, that's it's not. Sorry, I don't even know where that came from. Sorry. Um, it, you mean that is this weird? Sorry. Like this? Is this what you're? Uh, there, there wasn't supposed to. It was just a mark. Are is it good? Net? Does it make? So yeah, what's the dotted line for? Oh, the dotted, oh, so the dotted line is like the path that a object might be traveling in. Like the dotted line, so wait here, okay, let's see. So I'm saying like the dotted line is a path that some object is in. Like over time, it's traveling in some arc of a circle. So, so, okay, uh, Oh, so that's the arc, those like dots. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. And, I'm and those saying, arrows move relative to the arc. Yes, exactly, exactly, right. So, right, right. So, in fact, yes, exactly. So, in fact, what we can say, and this is almost, we're almost done, what we could say, okay, well, okay, wait. Uh, actually, so I'll say. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. That's good because, all right, so I'll finish this one.
Um, right. So I'm heading towards an equation, but we're almost there. But the first thing I'm saying right now is like, right, at any given moment, if you're in an arc, like, like you keep changing, like at any given moment, if you're in an arc, at that moment, there's a line that points from you to the center of the circle. That line's called a radius. And I'm saying right now that at that moment, you have got to have some component of acceleration pulling you in along that line. That component of acceleration represents how hard your direction's being changed, right? But, but then perpendicular to that radius at any moment, at any moment, there's also this tangent line. The tangent line to the radius at any moment is the direction you're actually heading in, right? The V vector that was on the page that Melita was just asking about, right? At any given place on a circle, there's two vectors that are perpendicular to each other or two directions, two axes that are perpendicular to each other. One is the radius, the other is the tangent line. And what I'm saying is the acceleration along the tangent line Okay, what I'm saying is, hold on. at such moment, velocity is always along the tangent line. Like it, it, well, yeah, it's along the tangent line. Like if you're a lifeguard at the pool and you're like whipping your like your whistle around like a long string, right? So the long string is what's pulling the whistle always in the circle. At every given moment, the long string is what's yanking the whistle and preventing it from just falling straight down or straight anywhere. At any given moment, the string in that whistle is what's pulling it in toward the center. But at any given moment, if you were to cut that string, the whistle would fly off on a on wh whatever direction it was going at that moment. So if right at the top, if you're whipping the whistle around and around and around, if you look at the top, of the circle. If you cut the string right then, the whistle would fly off to the side it, at first. I mean, eventually it would fall down, of course, but at first it would go off to the side. If you cut it at the bottom, it would fly off to the other side. If you cut the string while it was while the string was to the side, the whistle would fall straight down, etc. Right? So the tangent line is the line that you are velocitizing along, right? Well, if you were to if you experience any force and therefore acceleration along that line, that line represents your change in speed, right? So A sub tan will stand for the tangential acceleration. And that is your change in speed at any moment. Like you might not have that. You could be in a circle that only has centripetal acceleration because you're going round and round like in a horizontal circle, for example, you might not ever be changing your speed. It's possible to have a circle where there's no tangential acceleration, but it's not possible to have a circle where there's no centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is what allows you to be changing your direction and thereby curving in the first place. Tangential acceleration is change in speed. For, but they're both perpendicular to each other, like not present in all circles. But for this reason, for this reason, when therefore, and we're just about done with this, I'm looking at the time, therefore, for any object that's in a circle or in a curve, in a curve, remember, okay, the whole rest of the exam, the whole rest of the lab thing, remember how we've been saying over and over again, it's always best to choose a coordinate system that's lined up with the expected direction of acceleration? Well, here's the thing, anything that's in a curve, we have an obvious coordinate system presenting itself to us here. Like if something's in a curve, there's two axes that are perpendicular to each other in that curve, the radial axis and the tangential axis. Like they're not X and Y, like right now at this moment in the curve, they might be like this. And then the next moment like, might be like this. And then like this, like, like they're sweeping around sort of like along the lines of Melita's question a minute ago, but I'm saying at any given moment in a circle, 
there's two obvious axes where a lot is happening on those axes and they're perpendicular to each other. And one of them is the axis that there must be acceleration along if we are indeed traveling in a curve. Therefore, when any object is in a curve, we it's best, it's strategic to choose to choose centripetal axis and tangential axis instead of choosing x and y or x and y. See, it's it's just an outgrowth of the same point that we're making over and over that we always like to line up our axes to, to match what's accelerating in a problem. Now we got this funny eyed thing that if you're in a curve, you're definitely accelerated in a way that does it doesn't look like acceleration because it's not speed change, but it's definitely there. So we line up an axis. We line up our axes with the radius and the tangent line to the circle at any point. And yes, that does mean that the axes are changing at every single point. That's okay. Believe it or not, that's okay. Um, and so we do, and I'm just about done with this. And therefore, for any given ax, for any given object in the circle, F net still equals ma right but instead of doing instead of but but now instead of doing x and y or whatever we say the sum of the f along the centripetal axis equals ma along the centripetal axis and the sum of the f's along the tangential axis equals ma along the tangential axis Okay, and we just do F net equals MA, like as always, right? But A tan, A tan will be, if, if it exists, will represent the change will represent change in speed per time and a cent, and this is where we're going to end for now. You'll just, you'll think about this. You'll talk about this, but a cent, and there sometimes, you know, this is optional. Sometimes there's an a tan, sometimes there isn't. But a cent in a circle, in any object that's moving a curve, definitely has to have a cent. It's, um, it's there even if your speed is not changing. But you have to have some speed. You have to have speed for any of this to be relevant. You have to be moving. A cent, here's the equation, always at any given moment, at any moment, at any point, at any point in a circle, your, your centripetal acceleration at that point must equal your speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. I'm just asserting that. I'm not going to pretend to prove it right now. We'll relook at it again in Physics 204. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to prove it or justify it or over explain it. I'm just telling you right now that, that conceptually to be in the curve of a circle is to have an acceleration and a velocity whose directions are in conflict, but to be in a curve of a circle, the magnitude of the acceleration and the magnitude of the velocity must be in harmony according to this equation. That it, it, it looks like a strange equation at first, but we get used to it. What it's really just saying it is things that you already know. Like if you're if if you're in a circle and you start to go too fast for that circle, you're like if you're driving a car and you're making a turn. If you try to go too fast for that turn, either either you're going to demand more of a force along the centripetal line to keep you in that circle. In other words, you might, if you're going to try to go faster, you're going to demand more from friction on the tires and you better hope the friction can hold the tires to make you go faster. So if you go faster, if you increase V, you're going to expect and hope that A increases accordingly. Or if it can't, if it won't, you're going to skid out of that circle into a circle of a bigger R, a bigger radius. In other words, the faster you want to go for a given centripetal acceleration, the bigger circle you're going to be in or vice versa. Um, why it's squared, I'm not going to get into right now. But, but one thing is the units cannot possibly work unless the V is squared. I mean, that's the simplest answer. But so 
The takeaway that you need for the, I'm not going to like walk you through it now. This will be the harder part of the exam. Most of it, the rest of it, I walk through in the other video. But the equation you need to sort of answer those last couple of questions about the moment in the circular arc is like just divide things up into components like everything else on the exam, divide into components, like track like a sine theta and a cosine theta. And whatever component is along the radial line, whatever component of acceleration is changing direction, it's equal to V squared over R. And the other component is, to, and therefore you can even, well, I don't think you need to say this, but actually that that's it. The, the component that changes direction that's along the radial line is always speed squared divided by radius of circle. And um, and the other one is just a change in speed. The, you'll, again, and, and it's uh, obviously it's a small portion of the exam, but that's what you need for that part. Now, I'm going to quickly say one other equation. I'm going to shift gears entirely. And again, partly I'm just throwing these things at you so that we have them before we go into 204. It's totally understood that I'm only spending like 10 minutes on each of these things. That's why it's only like a couple of questions at the end of the exam. And maybe I'll even make those tidier. Believe me, it's understood. Like the vast portion of the exam is related to the stuff that we spent the vast portion of time on. Believe me. Um, but the other one last thing I want to give you that's actually even easier than that, honestly, or easier to deal with, certainly the exam. The one other thing that I want to leave you with is, is this. A lot of this course and the exam is about Galileo's principle of relativity, which all seems very conceptual, but it actually underlies all this math. And the and it comes in all these different forms, Galileo's principle of relativity. But the really the central, the first way that it emerges in our life is the idea that Earth is not special. Earth seems like at first, it feels like that it's stable and it's this stationary ground underneath us sitting at the center of the universe that holds us still while we watch the rest of the universe go past us, right? That's how it feels to us every day that the whole sky is rotating past us. It feels like the ground is stable beneath our feet. It feels for centuries as though we are watching as sun and moon and planets and stars all go past us. Right, but it turns out we say, no, actually it feels like this earth is the center of our whole universe, but that's not actually true. The earth is just a rock among countless flying through space, obeying all the same laws as all the other rocks that are flying through space. Ultimately, the point of Galileo is saying the laws of the, the physics laws that govern the heavens are the same as the physics laws that govern earth. It is as in heaven as it is on earth is really the Galilean like epiphany, so to speak, right? So we do all this physics based on the recognition that the laws of physics are the same out here as down here. And down here, we're just on a rock that's flying through the heavens, just like anybody or anything else. That's all true, right? The only thing is, the thing is that for this entire course, we keep drumming, we keep drumming in Galileo's principle, but we also keep having this one thing, this one exception to all of our rules. Every time we draw a free body diagram or system schema, we always start by saying, oh, by the way, the earth has this special property of pulling us without touching us at all. The earth is always pulling on everything towards the center of the earth without touching it. Once you put that in your free body diagram and you call it MG, um, then, then from there on in, every other force that you ever deal with is recognizable by physical contact. Every other push or pull, things have to be touching in order uh, for them to interact. 
but the earth seems to have this special property where it can pull down on us without touching us at all. So it seems like a contradiction. It seems like all of our physics is based on the earth is not special. And yet it seems like the earth has this special property of exerting gravity on everything that's standing on it. So what's up with that? Well, the one thing, and you, you know probably where I'm about to go with this. The one thing I want to leave you with is the recognition that no, even that, even though we've been treating gravity as an exception all the way through, and even though gravity is a very, very special type of interaction that's like very, very important to study in Physics 204, even gravity is not an exception. Even gravity, even gravity is not a special property of Earth, as you know from other courses, but let's just make it clear. It turns out that it's not just Earth that pulls on every mass toward it. It turns out, as you've heard in other aspects of your life, that Newton developed a law known as the universal law of gravitation. Newton, and this is a much longer discussion and we will get into it in 204, but I want you to have the sneak preview or whatever, or and Mercedes will get into it in 204. But, but what we realize is that for any two point masses in the world, for any two masses in the universe, call it M1 and M2, if two masses are separated by a distance R, it turns out that for all masses in the universe, for any two masses, any two electrons, any electron and a proton, any it doesn't they don't have to have charge any like any any neutron and another neutron, like a grain of dust in my breast pocket and a grain of dust in the Andromeda galaxy, any two points of masses at all, exert a force on each other, which is the mass of one times the mass of the other divided by the square of the distance between them and all multiplied by this big constant known as capital G, this big universal constant, which you don't have to memorize, which you can always look up on the web, but which is what you, you need to know is the same for any, for everywhere and anything in the universe. Uh, it's this. It's 6.67, it's approximately 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared divided by kilogram squared. In other words, for any two masses that you ever pick in the universe, you multiply the two kilograms together, divide by the square of the distance between them. You'll now have something in meter squ I mean, kilogram squared divided by meter squared. If you multiply that whole package by this one constant number called G, it its units are, ha its units have Kilogram squared in the denominator, they have meters squared in the numerator, so they all cancel out. And they also have Newtons in them. So if you multiply two masses together and divide by the square of the distance between them, and then multiply by this constant to make the units work out straight, you'll end up with a force measured in Newtons. And that is the force that any and every point mass in the universe is exerting on any and every other point mass in the universe all the time. That is universal gravitation. The MG from planet Earth is just one example of that. That's all you need to know for that. And I promise you, that's all you need to know. That's the other equation you need to know to plug in the numbers from the end of the exam into that. It's meant to be a plug-in just to make sure that you have this equation under your belt. Um, but it's also meant to be the like last thing we say in the course, just to drive home the point that it is in heaven as it is on earth. The earth is not special. I then, wait, 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 no, wait, wait, no. Um, and so, okay, and so that is it. So have a very nice week and holiday and come find me tomorrow if you wish and or text or email me, but you've been amazing. Right, I have to go get him now. Thank you for asking. I'll tell him you're asking. Um, you've been lovely. I'm going to leave right now. Goodbye. <laughs>